Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from SalesPop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from a sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Emmy Sobieski, who is in probably equally, if not even sunnier, climbs in Florida. How are you doing, Emmy? Doing great. Thank you so much for having me on, John. Of course. And uh, Emmy is the author of the $100 million Careers, is currently COO of Performative Speaking and CEO and co-founder of Competitive Storytelling, Inc., both of which help founders with world-class ideas share, to share their stories, to change the world. And that's what we're going to talk about today is how to create your $100 million career. Sounds fantastic, Emmy. Um, so let's let's start with number one. Where, um, tell me the genesis behind your book and your whole concept of, of this and, and how you came to it. Originally, I wrote a course on investing that was 60,000 words. And part of that course included um, the five careers where I see the most leverage. And what I found was when people would go through the course, it was obviously 60,000 words, so very lengthy. And I got the most positive feedback about those five careers. So I decided to turn it into a book. And it's my way to mentor at scale. It's the same tips that I've given many of my mentees who went from very humble beginnings, community college, parents not having even gone to college, to um, to millionaires by the age of 30, and they're on their way to 100 million. That's fantastic. And so um, what, it is, what is it that you discovered that was able to take people who perhaps, you know, some wouldn't have had the confidence or wouldn't have thought that they could do these things? Um, what, what did you discover that was able to that you could apply to anybody and help them on their career? The main thing is self-confidence. It can't be blind, but to understand your own personality and really understand what your gifts are and then go for it. And that's what I found with several of my mentees. They had a lot of talents, a lot of gifts, but they didn't really believe in themselves. So it was not blindly believing in them, but showing them, hey, here are the areas where you're really talented. One of my mentees was like, well, you know, there's more jobs in management consulting versus investment banking. So that's what I think I'm going to do. I don't think I'm going to go the investing route. And I said, you've been in my investing. I had kind of a side investing class. And I said, I can see a tremendous talent for investing. And I know that if you just put 100% of your focus there, you'll be very successful. And he has become very successful. So it was things like that. It's, it's matching your personality to your career. But once you really find something that you love and that you're also good at, then believe in yourself and find other people that believe in you. Yeah, and, and I think that's fantastic because I think, uh, as you said, I mean, not everybody is, I mean, confidence is something that you have to develop over time. It's not something that everybody is blessed with out of the gate. Uh, but also, I, I like that idea of um, somebody externally being able to say, hey, actually, you're, you've are you got talents in this area because we often lack self-awareness and, you know, that can undo us. And sometimes we think we're good, really good at things that we're probably not good at or we want to be good at things that we're not really um, talented at. And we, we miss out on the things that we're good at because uh, we don't even have the confidence or nobody's ever pointed it out to us. Yeah, absolutely. There's a There was an old, and I don't even know if it was a Harvard study or just one of these things where someone told me it was a Harvard study, but it was this effectively Venn diagram before Venn diagrams were popular that said, find out what you love doing that other people think you're good at that you can also get paid for. So that's another interesting way to look at it. Yeah, and and the, and the thing is that often, I mean, in in the culture we have, even the corporate or business culture we have, we often focus on the things that people don't do well, right? We're so obsessed with fixing things, and and that's why I always say ad nauseum on this on this channel. It's like you think of performance reviews. You know, they come up once a year. What do they do? They go, oh, hey, Emmy, you did these two things really well. Now here's fifty two things that you need to work on, and that's always where our focus in instead of going. Here's your strengths. This is fantastic. Let's figure out how we can how we can do more of this, how we can reconfigure your job or your role. And it's just like what you're saying, reconfigure your career or, or your aspirations to what you're actually really good at. 
Yep, yep. And try to instill leverage into your career at every at every point. A lot of people, especially with the current banking crisis, a lot of people think about leverage as a negative thing, like, oh, that means debt. But think about how every moment you can leverage to move your career forward. And I think one of the other parts of it that's really important nowadays, particularly, is investing in your own brand, if you like. And and that kind of sometimes seems a little hokey to some people. But the reality is that you also have to be your best PR person, too. And and because we're, you know, everything is so digital and stuff, you have so many opportunities to show your expertise or what you're good at. But you have to be the one to drive that. Yeah, yeah, and one of the things that I that I talk about which which relates to your company as well is to build your own personal CRM. And so this reflects back on what I was saying in terms of find personal leverage. So imagine two different people are going into one of the five careers that I recommend in my book. Mm-hmm. Let's say but a very common path to go into those careers is through investment banking. And your first two years as an investment banker, you are creating spreadsheets, figuring out like basically spreadsheets, pro formas for companies. And then you're actually working on pitch decks for those companies that are going through an IPO or maybe they're merging or whatever. So you're just creating pitch decks and um, then you're, printing them and carrying copies to lots of meetings and you're handing them out. This could be very, this could be something where you're just like, oh my God, I just have to get through these two years. But imagine if at every meeting you got the name and the names of each person in that meeting and maybe you're working this investment bank and you shouldn't be personally contacting the CEOs of the clients, Mm -hmm. but you could link with them on LinkedIn or follow them on LinkedIn and you put in your own spreadsheet or a CRM where you met them, where they were working, and you start to create links. The most powerful connections are actually the weak links in our network. And so it's important to build a broad CRM and then think about everything that you're doing every day. How could I leverage that? How could that grow my career and push it forward? Even if it's something as simple as creating PowerPoints, handing them out and going to meetings, you're still meeting people. You still have this great opportunity to build your career and move it forward. Yeah, no, I like that idea a lot. And I think we tend now, we build these passive networks and we think we build networks, right? We have our LinkedIn network and we think, you know, we meet people and all that. And, you know, maybe we connect on LinkedIn, maybe we throw the scan their business card or QR code nowadays or whatever it is. And we think, oh, yeah, yeah, we, we, we've got good networks, but they're largely, they're passive though. We don't really do that much with them. So my, one of my friends who is, worth more than a hundred million. Um, and of those friends, I have changed their names in my book, mm-hmm. started a, this, this CRM that I'm talking about, this personal CRM when she was in high school and each, each month, each quarter, each year, she has in there when she contacts someone and how. So if she wants to maybe write them an email. So let's say someone is really important to your network. They're also doing the similar career that you are um, and you both are friends and it's easy enough. It's like, yeah, well, I'll contact them, but, but it's just better to put it in a system and make sure even if you're friends, et cetera. And so she has this process where at least once a year, everyone gets a Christmas card or they get an email checking in. And then depending on how, you know, what, what she looks at as how often she'd like to contact them. Some people it's more often. And so you just, you can build a system that makes your network, your big, huge network actually a, you know, a valuable network and not just, as you say, a passive network. Yeah. And obviously part of that is, is the quality. I mean, because sometimes, because you know, we live in this world today where everything is, is seems to be valued on volume. So, uh, and, and people think, okay, well, I need to have a bazillion people in my network to, to feel good. But if like 99% of them are people who are, who you're never going to contact, who are never going to be of any help to you or you to them, it's kind of pointless. And I think people need to be a little bit more discerning. 
Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. Um, and at the same time, you just never know. Sure. Um, somebody, somebody may be, for, for instance, there was, there was somebody that I hired at a previous employer, CoinCloud, and he was a coffee barista. And I hired him to do over-the-counter crypto options trading. Now, why would somebody like this have any qualifications? Well, it turns out that when he was serving coffee and it was he was really looking to become a coffee sommelier he was very passionate about it when he was serving coffee he was serving coffee to a gentleman who was retired off of one of the biggest of off the chicago board of trade which is the biggest place that you can trade options in the u.s so he's an absolute expert and he would basically the guy that i hired would pour him some extra coffee or some extra cappuccino shots and then then get taught about options trading. And so he started sharing what he was learning on Twitter and was discovered by an ex by a mentee of mine who said you need to hire this guy as your junior trader. Turned out to be incredibly talented, made the company millions of dollars. So you, you just, it's, it's like this balance. You don't want to be too hung up by titles because sure. you never know through kind of the sixth connection who somebody else might know or what they might know. And I think one of the other things, um, and I found this a lot is that, and I'm sure you have too with some of your mentees and that is that sometimes we don't feel like we have the, you know, the capabilities or the resilience or the, this to push through to where we want to go to. But if we take a quick look back, it's often we can find great examples of where we have overcome things, where we've really, you know, overcome great obstacles, where we've come through and we, where we are today and all of this. And it can give us great confidence going, because sometimes we don't even look back and realize how far we've come and the capacity that we have for growth. Yeah. Yeah. And it can go both ways, right? Yeah. It's because sometimes, sometimes you get overconfident. I'm just reading, um, I'm just reading the book, Ego is the Enemy. You can either get overconfident or underconfident. And so it's important to try to be balanced in how you look back be, or you can spend all your time looking back at your previous achievements and not move forward. Um, in the in the stock market, we always say you're only as good as your last trade, <laughs> which isn't uh, entirely true. It's a little bit mean. <laughs> or your next one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so how how then do you, as you said, the confidence part? Like, how do you help people uncover or build that build that confidence in themselves to be able to you know take on what they really want to take? Because there's obviously a, a drive in there somewhere that they want to move forward. That it's just you know, confidence or, or what they think is expected of them or external factors maybe are holding them back? I think one big thing is just leading by example. So you can probably just tell from me, I don't put on a lot of airs. Um, I try not to, I try to be, try to be modest and I try to learn all the time as best I can. And so I think that that helps my mentees see that it's not some big unachievable thing. If I make mistakes, I say, oh, I made a mistake. And so they can see that I'm human the same as they are. So that there's part of it is just by being a good example. And the other is just by pointing things out. So I had, I told you about the one mentee who said he was gonna hedge his bets by going into management mm -hmm. consulting. And I said, no, you know, I have seen this, I know, you will be successful. Just put 100% of your focus on being an investor. And I think because of my previous success and because of how committed I was and what I said to him, he just believed me. And that's what he did. He didn't worry about management consulting for one more second in his career. <laughs> he just went 100% in. And and uh, But I had another mentee who had a passion around trading. And he had created the the trading community in at UC San Diego when he was there. He created the trading group. He did all these different things. And I would have my old bosses or different people come into our little investing group and speak. And so one of my old bosses, who's a billionaire and very famous hedge fund manager, he came in to speak. And I would have each mentee or student say, 
what their major was when they're graduating and what their career objective mm -hmm. was. And he, this mentee says, my career objective is to be a professional trader. And my old boss said, that'll never happen. No one will ever hire someone straight out of college to trade other people's money like an institutional. That like, that'll never happen. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so he leaves. And I quickly said to my mentee, because of, of course I don't want him to lose confidence, yeah. but I said to my, but there's different ways to point this out, right? I could say, oh, it's going to be okay or something, right? <laughs> but I didn't. I said, here is the most important lesson that you just learned. And he said, what? And I said, that a brilliant billionaire hedge fund legend can be wrong mm -hmm. because you're going to go out there and you're going to get that job. And he focused so much and interviewed in so many places and got turned down so many times, but he actually turned, he actually ended up turning down Deutsche Bank, which was a huge, that's a bulge bracket firm mm -hmm. because he got a separate job that he really wanted as a prop trader. So, um, you know, so he, he interviewed enough, he went after it enough, he believed in himself enough. And, but that moment was a turning point because it's almost like you can have somebody who's so impressive tell you you can't do it and if you can overcome that then there's nothing in your way that can get in your way yeah i, I mean I, I love i love that example uh, and the uh, and the resilience because i think resilience is so so important and the ability to keep going i know my um my my son acts and uh you know, it's like sales talk about how many times you get rejected is is unbelievable amount of times, you know, and, and but the, but it's that resilience to keep going in the belief that you have what it takes, and that you have some obviously some evidence to validate that too. But but I just think resilience is so, so important. And I think because we live in this kind of shortcut culture today, that people often give up too easily, because they think uh, the world is telling them, oh, everything should be happening easy and quick for you. Yeah, yeah, and it and it doesn't, and mm -hmm. it doesn't, but but we can surround ourselves. I mean, I would say we do live in a shortcut culture, but there are people that still want to do things the right way mm -hmm. and the long way and build something meaningful. And so, pay attention to who you surround yourselves with. Pay attention to you know you you are the product of your five closest friends that you spend the most time with. So pay attention to who that is and don't be afraid to change that to improve your situation. And I love you that you raised that point because I, I think that's one of the most important ones is to examine the universe around you. Uh, and as you said, the people who you are you know, associating with and who you're taking inputs from, because oftentimes, you know, you'll find that there's somebody in there who maybe is, is negative or drags you down. But you have to ask yourself is why are you keeping that person? Because they're serving some purpose for you. It's not a good purpose, but it's your fault that you're keeping that person in your, in your universe. Yeah, it is your, it is your choice. And there's a great, um, one of the authors that I enjoy, David Rico, writes about this. He calls it CIA, criticize, interfere, and advise. And I always thought, you know, advice is really nice. Advice is something that I give. Advice is, and, and I think, okay, the people in your network that are just criticizing you all the time, bringing you down, well, you need to look at the criticism and see if it's right, but generally that's not really great. And people that are interfering all the time, trying to get in your business, that's pretty obvious too. But it wasn't as obvious to me that when people are always giving advice, that they're actually getting in your business because they don't want to be in their own business. And so they also may not be a healthy part of your network. Or you may just say, well, okay, I still, you know, I, I love them, their family. I'll just kind of try to reduce the interactions. But what I found with all, when I kind of categorized people a little bit in my, in my CRM of, of like, who's CIA, who's just doing the A part, who's the I, you know, who's kind of partial CIA type of a thing. And I went down that whole list. The interesting thing to me was that the people that weren't any of those things, the people that are just wonderful, supportive friends, I, I didn't get to see them as much because they're not the squeaky wheel. The CIA people are the squeaky wheel. 
And so there's two benefits to seeing that is that you can just say, okay, I am going to make an effort with my CRM, with who I reach out to, to reach out to those people that aren't the squeaky wheel that are, that, that may be a healthier piece of my network. Yeah, uh, that that's a great point because um, I, I was saying at one stage that you need to be careful of your inputs, right? So say if you're on the way to a really important meeting or or this day you're, you know, this is a really important trading day, whatever it is, and, and you start off with maybe the news or something and it's all, and as I always say, the news isn't to inform, it's to provoke. It doesn't matter where you are on the spectrum. Uh, the days of inf- information have gone. It's all about provoking emotions. So now you're a little wound up. Uh, or you're on social media and you see things and maybe you see other people who look like they're having a great life. So now you're even more wound up. So now you're going into your day and into your meeting, into this important thing with the wrong inputs. Be far better if you called one of those people that you just talked about, one of those people who are really supportive, who you just enjoy being with, who always lifts you up. Boy, the difference in the outcome would be tremendous. Yeah, yeah, or... Don't even go on social media. Don't go, you know, just, I, um, I'm really, really blessed that right now my, my, what, what do we call it? The, um, morning routine (laughs) is to get up at 445 and I go for a walk with one of those wonderful, supportive, sweet friends at 530 every morning. And then we both drive to the gym and we both go to the gym at 630. And so it's just a wonderful way to start the day with friendship interaction, no social media, no phone. And, and you just feel like, okay, now this is just a one, a a great foundation for the start of every day. Yeah, no, I I think that's great. And I think that's rooting you in, in, in the positive and, and also in keeping, and there's nothing wrong with keeping your world like that kind of keeping contained because at the end of the day, um, it's better to have those small positive influences contained than to spread yourself so far all over the place that you, you kind of lose who you are. And then the last thing I wanted to say to you is everything that you said about being humble and all of that. I think that's the, the other part is, is the authenticity piece. And I, and I hear people all the time talking about, Oh, you need, people need to be more authentic and here's how you can be more authentic and let me teach you how to be authentic. And I'm like, really? But I do think if more people started to be their real selves, to be humble, to show, um, to show who they really are. I mean, that's what people crave at the end of the day. Yeah, well, and it shows other people. So let's say you want to build a hundred million dollar career, mm-hmm. what, whatever you want to do, and there's someone that can can teach because they're ten percent ahead or ahead mm-hmm. or you know a decade ahead or whatever it is. If you, if they don't seem approachable, if they don't seem authentic, they don't seem real, then it doesn't give anyone else hope that they can make it, that they're like them, that they have you know, issues just like them that they struggle with every day. Yeah, absolutely. And as you said, don't be afraid to say that you don't know something or that you made a mistake. I I have much more confidence and respect in people who every so often tell me that they don't have a clue about what I just asked them about or, or, or that they made a mistake. Those are people I trust. The people who always have the answer are not so much. (laughs) Agreed. Agreed. (laughs) So listen, this is fantastic. Thanks. And all Emmy's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and your companies. Uh, Yeah. So competitive storytelling, I'm the COO and we help founders tell their story in a way that attracts customers, talent, capital, because these great founders that are going to change the world are going to do it through phenomenal storytelling. And then my book, $100 Million Careers, is a way for me to mentor at scale. And it talks about um, basically how to break in, build equity, and break out. And those are the three steps to really building a big career, mostly in finance, because that's where Mm -hmm. I have knowledge. And then anyone wants to reach me, you can reach me on my LinkedIn at Emmy Sobieski. And you can also, I have tons of blogs and lots of resources. This podcast link will be up there too. EmmySobieski.com is my website and that will have all the resources, lots of free stuff for people. Fantastic. Well, listen, I, I would encourage people to go check it out here. Get your $100 million career going. Check out uh, Emmy's work. And, uh, and thanks again for today. And thank you for watching and listening. And I'll see you all again soon. Thank you. Thanks for having me.